we are glad you are with us again uh, for Church Online. Now, if you've been with us the last couple weeks, you know, we started a series on the Psalms, and we're just kind of finishing out the summer um, by looking at just Psalms we've selected that we really like. So I know Kev uh, did Psalm 27, I think it was last week, and we started the week before that was Psalm 1. Today, we're going to be in Psalm 63, and we're going to be kind of jumping around to just various Psalms, but we thought there's always some good stuff in here. And these are, again, songs of praise or poems uh, that were largely to be sung um, by the Israelites as are written and then have been sung on and off by the church for centuries. And so there's a lot of incredible things in them. But I want to start today just by asking you a question. What do you live for? Like, I will never forget. I look back to when I first met Marlo, my wife. I had a very single focus. We started dating, um, and, and even before that, you know, I just wanted to be with her and, and you know, get any chance I could to hang out with her. And I won't get into all the stories, but I, you know, I was, I was a crazy man. I would do anything to try to convince this girl to marry me. So there was a, a period at which she traveled to Europe with her brother and her cousin and a friend of theirs. And I was writing her songs. And, and there was even a point at which we had a German exchange student that started coming to our youth group back in Santa Maria. And he was going to leave at the end of the school year and go back to Germany. And my wife had arranged before that to stop and visit him. And so I wrote her a song and I recorded on cassette tape. I don't know if you remember what those are. And it was called like Absence Makes the Heart Grow Fonder. Just cheesy. But anyway, I was devoted. I was focused. I, I was, I lived for the opportunity or the chance to just be around her, be with her. I would do anything. And, and you remember that. Or for those of you that have, you know, been in love or are married or whatever, you remember those days. I want to read you 2 Corinthians 11 before we get to Psalm 63. Listen to this for a minute. This is Paul writing to the churches of Corinth. He said, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So he's using this husband and wife as the picture of the church. Uh, but then he says, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And one translation says a simple and pure devotion. So I just wonder when I say, what do you live for? Think about the devotion in your life. The Bible takes up this picture, this, this metaphor of a wedding all over the place. It starts and ends with a wedding. Um, and this idea of devotion and faithfulness in, in God's relationship with Israel and their relationship with him. And then now in the church, it's all over the place. The covenant, it's a major theme. And so I want to think about this covenant for a minute today and, and just ask about your devotion to God. And what I think we'll find is some strong encouragement from Psalm 63, just to rekindle that or, or even just to just get us fired up about that again. What are some of the things we live for? Uh, some people call these idols, the things we really love. Like here's, here's a few that I thought of just in our culture, and these are true in other parts of the world, of course, too. But think about choice. Like you go online and you can search and find a million. They say you're going to buy something. You can you can compare prices within a split second. We have choice. What brand do I want? Where am I going to get it from? How fast is it going to get here? Think about comfort. Uh, we're in a period right now in Elmina where it's just hotter than normal. And I'm whining because I hear my next door neighbor's AC go on. Like I love to be comfortable. Um, and I don't mean comfort just in temperature, but we love comfort in many ways. Think about safety and security. Those are things we take for granted here in our country most of the time, and we have a high value on those. We can even worship those or, or, or place those in a spot of idolatry. What about control? Uh, for those of you that just love to have things go your way, I get this way sometimes. I want it to go the way I think it should go. I want to be in control. It's an illusion, but, but I want it. Uh, what about leisure and free time and vacations? These are things we value in our culture, and there's nothing wrong with necessarily any of these things so far. But when they take a place where we are so driven and focused to attain those and to maintain them and have them, it can easily get in the way of our devotion and our focus on God. Just a couple more. Independence. This is one that we, we, we highly value in our country. I don't need any help from anybody. And often men, people like me, we, we were the last ones to ask for help. So we're usually terrible at this. Whereas dependence is where God calls us to be, I think, often. Another one, this one's obvious, is wealth and stuff, just material things. And we are so blessed and wealthy in our country and in my own life that, that I, I, it's so easy to let that become 
a focus that's too strong in my life. Just even maintaining the stuff we have just takes a lot. And it's a lot of work. And so it's easy to get that out of whack. Uh, another one is family, a good thing that can easily take a place of idolatry or too much devotion in our lives. And I could go on, but just think for a minute about the things in your life that, where you're tempted to pour so much focus and energy that it distracts you from your walk with God. That's what I mean about this being led astray from a simple and pure devotion to Jesus. So my heart is that, that we would just be shaken out of that today or, or woken up in that. Our human, uh, our hearts, they're, they're prone to worship. We're made to worship. We're made to love things. That's how we're designed. So it's, it's natural then that we could easily get off track or out of whack in that. Since the fall, since Adam and Eve, uh, we've struggled to worship God first and foremost. We all do. This is the greatest problem of humanity. Who are you devoted to? Who do you worship? Jeremiah 17, 9 reminds us that our hearts are deceitful and wicked, and who can know them? Sometimes we don't even see that our devotion is out of whack. We don't even notice it. Remember the Israelites, they're given the Ten Commandments. I mean, they're, they're, Moses comes down off the mountain after being up there, and, and they were said, don't touch the mountain. His face is glowing. He gives them. Um, and one of the first things he says or one of the commandments in there is you shall have no other gods before me. And actually, before you can come down, they say, all right, well, let's make a golden calf and worship that. You're like, what? How'd that happen? Uh, idols, idolatry, worshiping other things is so, it's our default method. It's our default mode of life. And an idol is really anything apart from Jesus that we believe we need to make us happy or satisfied or, or fulfilled. I like that's one definition of idolatry. So again, ever since we were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, we've been at odds with the idea that God alone deserves our affection and praise. We need someone to come in and give us new hearts that will worship him in this way. So listen to this quote. This is a lady named Rebecca Pippert who wrote this. Whoever controls us is our Lord. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by acceptance. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the Lord of our lives. And she, she says, Lord with a lower L. So these things, if it's, you know, again, acceptance or, or power or whatever, those things actually control us. St. Augustine said this, You've made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. Another writer I came across, this was actually in a sermon manuscript, so it was actually originally preached, but said the difference between trusting idols and trusting Jesus is like the difference between drinking seawater and drinking fresh water. So you got seawater here, fresh water here. So two things happen when you drink the seawater. You get thirstier, and then eventually you start to go crazy. Imagine you're out floating in the ocean, you're stranded. Idolatry is like that. Your view of reality becomes warped. Something that seemed so wrong in the past is now acceptable. Worse still, the more you drink with the salt water, the thirstier you become. It doesn't actually satisfy. So let's talk about this satisfaction. We're going to see in Psalm 63 a profile of devotion from, this is one of the Psalms of David. And I'm just going to give you three principles. And there's a couple other sub points. But the first one is this. Only God can meet the deepest longings of your heart. Listen to the first couple of verses of Psalm 63. And if you have a Bible, go open that up. Or if you haven't done that yet, turn that on. It says, Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus, I've beheld you in the sanctuary to see your power and glory. Your power and your glory. So uh, there's going to be three sub points here, but the, the main idea is only God can meet the deepest longings of your heart. So let's talk about this longing. First, we see at the very beginning in verse one, this longing comes from an intimate knowledge of God. He says, God, you are my God. This isn't God I know about you, or I hear people worship you, or I've seen you from afar, but oh God, you are my God. This is a cry out to the very God he believes in. This isn't just mere personal, or excuse me, uh, you know, this, uh, mental assent. This is personal knowledge to know, to experience. Jesus talked about this a little bit in quoting Isaiah. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So this David's God isn't a God far off that they're just talking about. He's saying, God, you're mine. You're my God. Then he said, I, we already read this, but I'll seek you earnestly. It could be translated early. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh 
yearns. That word yearn could be translated, maybe yours says is faint for you. So I am, I, I'm longing for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So he's seeking him earnestly. This is an intimate knowledge of God. This isn't just, I, I heard about God or I met you one time. I remember back in my life, I said, God, I need you right now. Like, a, like someone in a dry and weary land that's desperately searching for water. This is this, and he, he's, he's anticipating with severe or like a strong attention. Like, I cannot wait to find you, God. I need you right now. So this psalm was written in the desert by King David. Just a little background on this one. Uh, He was in trouble, right? It's ironic that we learn about his devotion or his longing for God here in the middle of a story of utter betrayal. It's actually treason here. Imagine your own son trying to kill you and take over your kingdom. Now, I have a son, but I don't really have a kingdom. But you can imagine, as King David uh, does this, we think it's one of two times Um, but it's Absalom, his son, trying to kill his father and take over his kingdom. There's a couple incidents where this could have been written, but the the same applies. In Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel 15, I want to read just a couple things out here, so it's worth taking a second to turn there. 2 Samuel 15, and this will give us a little context uh, for this. So again, Absalom is, is David's son. He's decided uh, the title of your little chapter heading. It might say Absalom's conspiracy. So he's conspiring to throw his dad off the throne. Um, and look at uh, first, or 2 Samuel 15, 6. It says, Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom, Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So whenever people would come into him, they would they'd bring people before Absalom for judgment. He was acting as king, basically. And in doing that, offering counsel and helping solve disputes, he won their hearts over. This is before he even tried to kick his dad off the throne. But then look down at verse 12, which will highlight a few sections here. And when Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor. So he called for David's own counselor to come. And uh, the conspiracy grew strong and the people with Absalom kept increasing. So now he's calling David's own people into his camp and it just continues to grow and grow and grow. And then verse 14, David said to all his servants who are with him at Jerusalem, arise, let us flee or else there will be no one to escape from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us and bring us down, bring ruin down on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. So David says, we got to get out of here. It's getting stronger and stronger. And now there's an army being amassed. And David says, it's time for us to get out. So after this, there's a long procession. His servants say, we'll do whatever you want, David. We're with you. So there's a long procession of him leaving the city. People are weeping. They have the ark and the priests and the warriors loyal to David. They're marching out with him. And then in verse 25, we see that David sends the ark back. It says, carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see it. So he says, I can't take the ark of God out of the city. So he sends it back. Then down at verse 30, David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives. So he's come down out of the city. He's going back up the mountain to exit. And he looks back and he weeps as he went. Barefoot and with his head covered. This This is like sackcloth and ash weeping. And it says, uh, all the people with him covered their heads and they went up weeping as they went. So there's just, he's just broken hearted leaving the city. All right. So now back to Psalm 63. This is, this is the time we think in which this was written after he's fled and just gone through this with his son trying to kill him. So he's, he's actually in the desert fearing for his life. He thirsts for God. He yearns for God. He wants to see God's power and glory. He doesn't say at this point in the prayer anyway, get my son out of here. But he says, God, I need you right now. I need you. He's got this intimate knowledge of God that makes him long for him. C.S. Lewis calls this our appetite for God. The next thing we see about this longing in this this subhead of only God can really satisfy the deepest longings, it it involves a deep appreciation for God's love. In verse 3, it says, I I want to see you in the sanctuary. Verse 3, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise thee. He says, God, your love is better than life itself. This is astounding because he fears for his life. He says, "You you know what's better than me living this life or being killed or whatever happens? It's your steadfast, faithful love. Paul wrote about this in, in, the, in Ephesians. It was actually in a prayer. He, he said, I'm praying for you being rooted and grounded in love that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. 
Again, I already said this, but this isn't just knowing about God, but it's experiencing God himself. So this longing for God, he says, I want you because your loving kindness is better than life or death or anything. The third thing about longing, before we get to the second point, is that it results in an outpouring of praise. Look at verse 4. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. It's spontaneous praise. And then later, the, the last verse, he says, my lips will praise you. Again, he, he, he thinks about God, even in this crazy time where he fears his life, and he says, I'll praise you. I'll bless you. I'll lift my hands. I will worship you no matter what. What are these feelings that make worship real for us? Sometimes, if you're like me, it's easy to come into a church service or some other setting, just start singing and not really be engaged emotionally and, and with my mind and my heart and my soul. But think about some of these descriptions just out of the Psalms themselves. Uh, there's stunned silence in Psalm 46. There's awe and reverence and wonder in Psalm 33. There's even this holy dread of God's power, like, God, you are so awesome. You just fall on your knees like, no way. There's things like brokenness, contrition, grief. In, in the Psalms, we see this all over the place. When we deal with our sin or the sins of our people or even the sins of a nation are talked about. There's gladness. There's gratitude, Psalm 30. There's hope in Psalm 42 and Psalm 130 and a bunch of others. And then longing for God like we see here in this Psalm and like we'll see in a couple weeks in Psalm 42. So this outpouring of praise, this worship, isn't just a time set aside, dedicated to worship God. That's important. We, you need to be a part of that. But this is, in David, just when I think about you, I worship you. I want to bless your name. One definition of worship is recognizing and acknowledging the supreme worth of God, setting our hearts and minds affection and attention on him. So as David thinks about his longing for God, it drives him to worship. So, only God can meet the deepest longing of your heart. Two more. Not only that, but only God can truly satisfy your soul. So talk about the longing of your heart, things you really want. But then think about satisfaction for a minute. Um, this is verse 5 of Psalm 63. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. This sounds a little strange to us, especially if you're, you know, a health nut or you like to eat healthy. And when he says, my soul is satisfied as with fat and rich food, you think, well, I don't want to eat that very much because it's bad for you. But David is thinking about that time in your life when you enjoy just that awesome meal, the one you love. Uh, just this last weekend, I had the uh, privilege to travel back to Louisiana for a family memorial. My aunt passed away and, and you know, that's sad, of course, but we had, you know, good to be with family and connect and kind of grieve together. But the other thing is Southern cooking is so good. One of the things we had on the way out of, of, the, of the state before I went to the airport is we looked up on Yelp, best restaurant around the airport area. And we got there and we checked it out and, and it's pretty reasonable. But I said, what do you recommend? She said, mac and cheese with the works. And I was like, what's that? And so it's, you know, it's mac and cheese, of course, real healthy for you. But it had crawfish, uh, gator sausage, some kind of chicken, all this Cajun type stuff. It was so good. So as I finished that meal, I sat back and thought, oh, that's so good. Satisfied. Like, oh man, you know, I just think of your favorite meal. You probably want to turn this off and get a snack. But you think of that, and that's kind of what David has in mind here. My soul is satisfied in you, kind of like that meal that I just love. Like, I'm just like, I can't get enough of this, God. And then he says, my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. Right? You eat the great meal, you thank the cook, or you, you know, thank your spouse or whoever cooked it for you. Man, that was so good. Thanks. You know, tell the chef I said, awesome. But it's that idea that my soul is satisfied. Have you ever felt that with God? You're like, I'm just good. This is so good right now. This is what David is reminding us of and thinking of and reminding us to just draw back out of us as we think about this psalm. Listen to Psalm 36, 7 about this steadfast love again. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of your delights, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Then Psalm 145, 14, the Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, this is to God, and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. So God alone can truly satisfy. And I think even things like food and the things that satisfy us in life are just shadows of this greater reality, reminders of something truer and deeper in us. 
David continues, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. So the night watch was a three, four hour period in, in their day with, you know, cities and, and raiding armies. Everybody knew about the night watch. But he's so consumed with God that he thinks about him when he's in this night watch, or even when he's trying to sleep. Then he says, you've been my help. And then in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. So he says, you've been my help. God, you've been with me in past circumstances that were brutal, where I thought I was going to be the end, or I thought we were doomed. And even now in this realization that my son is coming after me with an army to try to take over the kingdom and kill me, you've been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. David is rejoicing because of this relationship with God, even in a dark time where he thinks this could be the end. Then he says, my soul clings to thee for your right hand upholds me. My soul clings to you, excuse me, for your right hand upholds me. This is verse 8. So he says, my soul is actually clinging. It's actually grasping, holding fast, following hard after God. So he's hanging on tight to this. This is a firm statement of commitment and trust in the midst of of a crazy circumstance in his life. And what do you seek satisfaction? What do you think about when you're in a hard time like that? I mean, your son probably hasn't tried to kill you, man. I hope not. That's awful. But in some situation, you're like, there's no way out. This I'm a goner. This is going to do me in. It could be a, a cancer thing or some, some brutal situation in your life financially where you're a family that's just falling apart. You're like, I don't know what to do here. Just cling to God as the encouragement of David. Grab out and grab, reach out and grab onto him. Jesus lived this out and just really seeking out God. He, his disciples came and said, hey, you know, we were talking about food. Where are we going to get food? We're out in the middle of nowhere doing all this ministry. And Jesus says to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus wasn't saying, I don't eat food. I, I just diet all the time or fast or whatever you want to call it. But he says, you know what really fills me up? You know what really satisfies me is doing the will of God and accomplishing his work. That's what drives me. The Apostle Paul wrote about it like this in Philippians 3. Whatever gain I had, I counted loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. He just described all of his work in the law before that and how that doesn't save you, basically. But I want righteousness that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So you can run after all kinds of things in life. And and if you're, you know, as old as me or even probably younger and older, you've tried it. You've tried chasing career or making the perfect family or getting the perfect portfolio or having enough money or the greatest house and playing the comfort and security and insurance. and You've tried some of those things or maybe all of them, and you know they don't satisfy your soul. You know they don't. They come up short. They're not bad things necessarily, but they don't, they don't do it. That leads to the third one. Only God can give you the kind of rescue you actually need. David needs rescue. He needs deliverance here. Look at verse... Um, Nine, excuse me. Those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. Like, Wait a minute, we have a change in tone here in the psalm. Before he's saying, God, I need you. I love you. Your steadfast love. I can't get enough. I'm clinging to you. You're, I'm under the shadow of your wings. I'm singing for joy. You're, you're holding me up. I'm, you know, all that. He's in, the, he's in the wilderness seeking refuge. But imagine having this confidence. Let's keep reading. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword they will be prey or a portion for jackals. This is verse 10. He says, I'm not worried about them. They're going to be delivered. They're going to be taken care of. My God will prevail. Listen to Psalm 91, 1 through 3. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Like you, you have this shelter, this shadow. God is looking out. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from deadly pestilence. Trust God. He will take care of you. Then in verse 11, it says, but the king will rejoice in God and all who swear by him shall exult. That's like praise him. The mouths of liars will be stopped. He finishes the psalm with these three verses just saying, God, I'm not worried about them. I'm turning it over to you. You will take care of it. 
And those who rejoice in you will be lifted high and they'll be vindicated. And those who lie and are speaking against me, thinking of a son Absalom specifically, his mouth will be stopped. The truth will out. It will work out. So again, the king has peace and confidence that if he has God, everything else is going to be okay. Doesn't mean he likes it, like, oh, bring it on. But he's just saying, God, I want to trust you. I want to run to you in this. Just like you wrote in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. There is nothing else I need if I have God. Listen to Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing that can take that away from you if you're in Christ. This is the kind of rescue you need. This kind of rescue David needs. God, I'm going to trust you for the outcome. You come. You save me. You come. You deliver. So I just want to ask a couple questions in thinking about, okay, this passion David has. How, how do we see if we have that? What, what, what do we do to evaluate that? Well, first thing I just want to ask is just a couple questions. One is, do you know him? If you don't yet know God, then you're like, oh, this, is, this is like alien talk to me. Huh? My passion for God, I yearn for him. Like my soul is satisfied like with my favorite food. What are you even talking about? If you don't know God yet, you, you can't relate to that. So come to him today. Uh, don't play church. Like if you're a part of our church or another one, don't if you, if you don't know what you think about God yet, that's okay. I guarantee, I don't guarantee, but I'm pretty sure your church, whatever it is and ours, I know. Just glad you're here checking it out, asking questions. Like what's this thing all about? Like I don't have this yearning for God or this longing, but Teach me, show me, what, what is that? Come to him and trust your life to him and you will find that he will fill you up in that way. There's a, one of my uh, most feared passages growing up. It's still kind of terrifying to me. I remember hearing this in, I think junior high it might have been, or maybe early high school is the first time, but um, they were talking about don't play church. That's what I want to encourage you with today. Don't, don't fake it. It doesn't do anybody any good. Like to act like you're a believer in Jesus if you're really not. Like you're not, you can fool me and who cares? Who cares what I think? But Jesus is speaking. This is kind of toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He's, he's been preaching on all these different things. <clears throat> Pardon me. And he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So <clears throat> he, he's, he's addressing this crowd. And he says, Just because you cry out, Lord, yes, and say, Yes, I believe in Jesus, or yeah, Lord, Lord means you're a part of the kingdom. So just because you claim to know God or you pronounce or profess faith in God <clears throat> and then don't do anything about it, that's that's not what a Christian is. It says it's the one who does the will. So someone says, okay, God, I believe in you and I'm going to submit to you and I'm going to seek to follow you. He said, if you just say the thing and they don't do anything about it, your life isn't changed, you don't act upon it, then that's good evidence that you, you really don't believe what you're saying. To call him Lord and Master and then say, but I'm not going to do what you tell me. She so says, that's not, that's not it. And he says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do mighty works in your name. So then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There's a couple important things in here. These are people that thought they were doing well and doing good things for God and his kingdom. But Jesus says, Depart from me because of two reasons. I didn't know you, and you're a worker of lawlessness. So this is the same thing I said before, but just worded differently. You don't actually know me. We don't have a relationship. You haven't come and asked for forgiveness and received me to, to transform your life. And then also you're a worker of lawlessness, meaning your life is still lived however you want. You haven't submitted to me. So you say you believe me, but you don't do anything I tell you to do. You're just being lawless. Like if I say, hey, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself, you say, no, nah, no thanks, then you don't really know him. You're still living in lawlessness. The reason I say that's terrifying is because in our society, and maybe in our church, and maybe in your church, or your life, or, uh, there are people that think they're okay with God, but they're actually not. They haven't surrendered to him. That's why I say, come to know him. You don't want it to be that at least everyone here on earth left and thought you were a Christian. That, don't fake it. It's not worth it. There's no point in that. Tricking people, even if it's close family or friends or people you love, don't be fake with them. I guarantee they would love if you had an honest conversation and say, you know, I don't know if I'd buy this. They would say, let's talk. Let's, let's work it through. So come to know him. And then for those that already do know Jesus, you're like, I don't know about this. I don't, I don't pray like this. I don't, I don't seek God earnestly. I just kind of go, oh, I should probably pray. Or, you know, my, I'm in a dry time in my life. Or maybe I even feel kind of far away from God for 
for whatever reason, maybe it's a circumstance or, or maybe there's something going on in your life where you just have a barrier between you and God or you feel something like that. Here's a couple of questions. Just think through. How is this appetite? Lewis called it an appetite for God. Do you look forward to spending time with God? And when you don't spend time with him, do you miss it? And I don't mean like, you know, five hours a day, but just in, in some time of your day, day or night or in the middle of the day or when you're out doing whatever, just talking with him. Uh, one, someone asked me one time, do you just pray at meals or do you pray other times? That's a legit question to ask. Should you pray at meals? Of course. Thank God for everything. But when you worship God, as I mentioned early on, do you engage your heart and your mind? Ask God to, to help you to focus on who he is through the words and the music and, the, and, and all of it. Another good question is, do you continuously seek other things besides God to satisfy you? If you just feel it's like I'm missing something and you go away from God to try to fill those voids, you will find yourself empty. Another one I already asked is when problems and hard times come your way, do you run to God? Sure, you can get advice and run to your family and it's good to get counsel and go to other people and have them come alongside you and pray with you. But do you go to God? We ought to. We ought to. Uh, Blaise Pascal said this, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator. And he became a Christian toward the end of his life, a brilliant, uh, I think it was mathematician, scientist, philosopher, a bunch of different things. But I've been reading a book lately about called The Anxious Generation. And this guy actually quotes the same quote. He's not a believer, the guy that wrote this. He's got some great things about um, how Smartphones have kind of rewired childhood and our culture in the West. But he said this, um, Many of my religious friends disagree about the origin of our God-shaped hole. After he quoted Blaise Pascal here. And he said, They believe the hole's there because we're God's creation and we long for our creator. And that's what I agree with too, and so did Blaise Pascal and Christians throughout the centuries. He said, but although we disagree about its origins, we agree about its implications. Listen to this part. There is a hole. An emptiness in us all. So he says, I, I recognize that. He doesn't believe in God yet, but he recognizes it. He said, we strive to fill it. If it doesn't get filled with something noble and elevated, modern society will quickly pump it full of garbage. That has been true since the beginning of the age of mass media. That's what he's talking about in this book. But the garbage dump got a hundred times more powerful in the 2010s, referring to the smartphone and social media. I'm, and my point is not his point, but even people that, like this guy's pretty, seems like a pretty smart researcher, but he recognizes that there's something missing in our lives and we need to fill it. And Blaise Pascal and, and the Christian faith and, and throughout the century says, God is the one that can fulfill that longing in your heart. God alone can do that. So I want to finish with, a, I think, an encouraging passage. <clears throat> It may not sound like it at first. It's out of the, the letters to the churches, the beginning of Revelation, where John speaks for Jesus and calls each one of them out and encourages and, and calls for change in some ways. But he says, this is just Revelation 2, 4. I have this against you. It said some good things about him. But you've left your first love. You might be thinking, how's that encouraging? Stay with me. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. So, there are times in my life where I go up and down and there's dry times. There's times when I'm on like kind of the mountaintop, like, you know, you come back from camp or a retreat or, or have this encounter with God and you're like, oh, I just feel so close. And then, you know, a few weeks later, you're back like, oh, where, where, what happened to that? You know, and, and so if you're in one of those times, think about these verses. And if you're not, put them in your back pocket for when the time does come, because it will. The Christian life isn't a mountaintop experience. It's got the valleys, it's got the deserts, it's got the, you know, ups and downs. He says, you've left your first love. If you feel like that love has waned or you're like, I just don't, what's going on right now? Listen to what he says. First thing he said, remember. That's what we're doing today. Like, man, I want to long for God like David did. And when hard times come, I want to run to God first. That'd be so awesome. I'm not doing that right now, but that's what I want to be like. I want God to remind me of this. So remember, that's first. We're doing that right now. But then it says, repent. Repent is turn from sin. Think the way God does about it. Remember, God, you, you do satisfy you are the one I need. That's right. And I was running after success or a bunch of money or the perfect family or whatever it is. And it didn't, it fell short. God, help me to love my family and have a you know, great job or whatever. But help me to remember that you're the one that's going to fill me up. You're the one I need the most. You're the one that's going to be the answer and the one to shelter me in your wing, under your wings. That's what I need to do. Repentance is just turning from the wrong way and turning back to God. It's a good thing. It's a positive thing. It's a grace that we have in our lives. So repent. Then it says, 
do the deed you did at first. And I think he's talking about, you know, since you've left your first love, you kind of lost it, it's waned. He says, go back to that first love. Just return to it. Return to loving God passionately. And this isn't the kind of thing where you stir up your emotions and then somehow you fix yourself and say, God, help that desire to reawaken in me. Go spend time, go on a walk and talk to God about it. And I guarantee you, he'll start to do that for you. Do those deeds you did at first. And back to where we began. This is true in marriage too, right? Um, you know, we, we talk about this longing we have. And you know, the longer you're married, the, the less romantic you kind of tend to become. And, and I hear sometimes I used to be more romantic. And you're like, ouch, but that's good to hear. Like, yeah, that's right. I still, we, we still love each other. And let's get back to those things we did at first. Maybe it's time to hit reset on our devotion and commitment to God. This isn't a message to make you feel bad. It's like, God, fill me with that longing again like David had. God never went anywhere. He never changed his commitment to us. And for that, we can be thankful. So I want to pray for this, just this, this reigniting of our desire for God, our longing for him, that he would just stir that up in us and that we would encourage each other in that too as we, as we see one another and just talk about, man, how good is God? Listen to what he did for me this week or what I heard about this week or the way he met me in prayer or he answered this or just in worship, I, I experienced him anew again. So let me pray that for you and for me and I'll say a couple more things. God, we need uh, constantly just to be reminded about uh, sometimes we get drawn away from the simple and pure devotion to you and just chase after other things. Get busy, get distracted. Uh, I know the enemy's wanting to draw us away. And so God, would we be filled with your spirit again, just the joy of our salvation, God, that you have come and given us life. And that God, we know you're more committed to growing us as it says in Philippians 1, 6. You who began the good work are faithful to complete it. So God, complete that work in us. Help us to, to spur one another on in this as we walk this life. And thank you for your word and David's passion that we got to learn about today. Fill us with that same passion. Because of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, well, I know we say this often, but if there's a way we could pray for you, you want to talk, you want to get together, stop in or send us a note and we can call you on the phone. But we'd love to encourage you any way we can. And I do want to say once again, get in church if you can this Sunday, wherever you're at, and fellowship with God's people, and we'll hope to see you soon. Thank you.